It is now my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker. You know her as America's doctor, providing the public with the best scientific information available on how to improve their health and the health of the nation. The 18th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Regina Benjamin, oversees the operational command of 6,500 uniformed public health officers around the world. From her early days as the founder of a rural health clinic in Alabama to her current position, Dr. Benjamin has forged a career that has been recognized by a broad spectrum of organizations and publications. Dr. Benjamin has a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Xavier University, New Orleans, an MD degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and an MBA from Tulane University. But she is also a product of the Atlanta University Center as well, having attended Morehouse School of Medicine and completed her family medicine residency in Macon, Georgia. In 1995, she was the first physician under age 40 and the first African-American woman to be elected to the American Medical Association Board of Trustees. In 2002, she became the first African-American female president of a state medical society in the United States when she assumed leadership of the Medical Association of the State of Alabama. Named by Time Magazine as one of the nation's 50 future leaders age 40 and under, Dr. Benjamin served as the United States recipient of the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights, and in 2008, was honored with a MacArthur Genius Award Fellowship. As we launched the wellness revolution at Spelman, who could be better to speak to us today as Dr. Regina Benjamin, and we welcome her as a woman who truly changes the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Regina Benjamin to the podium. Good afternoon, <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice a little bit, so hope you can understand me. But thank you, thank you, President Tatum, to my fellow honorary recipients, to the chairman of the board, the trustees, to my Saras of Delta Sigma Theta, <laughs> and the wonderful soror sorority sisters of our um, so our fellow sororities and other sororities, such as AKA and Zeta Phi Beta and others. <laughs> yes. To the faculty, the parents, the families, and the friends, but especially to the class of 2013. Yes. On behalf of President Obama, I bring to you his sincere congratulations. See, we're not getting rained on, so. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here to join a long list of Spelman's College commencement speakers, such as the First Lady Michelle Obama, the Honorary Shirley Chisholm, Ms. Oprah Winfrey, Ms. Alice Walker, and Ms. Toni Morrison. It's really an honor. I'm also honored to be here to be a part of your very special day, because today you are joining 6.7% of the world's population that has a college degree. And also, I do hope that you'll go on to get an advanced degree. Spelman has empowered you and educated you to take your place in the world and to create positive social change, which I know that you will. You know, people often ask me um, what they should call me. Should they call me surgeon? Should they call me general? What, what, how do they address me? Well, I prefer doctor. But while my formal title is surgeon general, the rank on my uniform is actually that of a three-star admiral. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> I 
which by the way, the only other person that outranks me is, is the president. But. <laughs> Thank you. And that's because I lead the public health service. And the United States Public Health Service is not quite understood by a lot of people, so I thought I'd tell you. You know, we're a branch of the military, um, except we don't carry a gun. We carry needles for vaccinations and things. So just as a Air Force protects our skies and the Navy protects our shores, we protect the public's health. The United States Public Health Service was begun as a service to provide health care to merchant marines, and the uniform is modeled after the Navy's and a tribute to the Public Health Service's nautical roots. The Public Health Service was created in response to a deadly outbreak of yellow fever that devastated the people of Philadelphia back in 1793 when that city was serving as our nation's temporary capital. The epidemic killed 10% of the city's population and drove a third of its residents out of town. And it was unknowingly brought to Philadelphia by the merchant, merchant sailors, who were a vital um, to the free flow of commerce that was the lifeblood of our young country. As a result, President John Adams signed into law a bill creating a national system of hospitals to treat the merchant marines. Some of us can remember the old public health hospitals. Today, our Commission Corps has over 6,500 officers who administer health programs across the country and abroad. We provide health care to people in health clinics, Indian reservations, and federal penitentiaries. I tell you this because it's an example of what a strong president can do in in response to a health care crisis. Just as President Obama is doing with the implementation of Affordable Care Act, and just as President Tatum is doing with the wellness revolution. You know, one of my former, um, actually one of my mentors, former Acting Surgeon General and Spelman's first alumni president, Audrey Forbes Manley, led the United States Public Health Service with this distinction. I thought I would share with you just a, a few minutes some of my personal experiences and hopefully simulate your thoughts on how you can continue to make a difference. When I was an intern, I attended the Medical Association of Georgia's annual meeting, and one of the intense issues that was being debated was that sexually transmitted diseases needed to be taught in medical school. I stood up in a room of maybe 20 people, and I told them I'd never seen certain diseases except in a textbook, and I thought there was a need. The resolution passed, and the Georgia delegation forwarded that resolution to the AMA. The Georgia delegation also sent me to the AMA to speak to that same issue, and the resolution passed. And within six months, every medical school in this country was encouraged to include sexually transmitted diseases as part of their core curriculum. I learned, thank you. I learned that one person can make a difference, whether it's in medical policy or in medical practice. And I learned that I could make a difference in medical practice when the National Health Service Corps sent me to Biola Battery, Alabama. It's a pretty place, but it's a poor place. I found a community of working poor too poor to afford medical care, but too rich to qualify for Medicaid. I like the people, I like the community, and I wanted to practice medicine there. But I quickly learned that practicing medicine wasn't just sewing up to shark bites. I had to deal with the land sharks, as I call them, the regulators, the reviewers, all the red tape, the paperwork, and all the things that go along with it. So I decided to stay involved in our community, involved in every organization that I could get services to our community. The United Way, the Red Cross, the hospitals, the Girl Scouts, the Chamber of Commerce. I learned that my patients had problems that my prescription pads couldn't, alone couldn't take care of, like adequate housing, <clears throat> especially after Katrina, employment opportunities, clean water. I just want to take a minute to tell you about one particular patient. And her name is Ms. Smith. That's not her real name, but that's her HIPAA name. That's what we keep her identity safe. Ms. Smith 
is an African-American lady about this high and overweight. In Viola Batcher, we have a diverse community, about 60% white, 30% Asian, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laotian, and about 10% African-American. Ms. Smith happened to be African-American, and she called me on a Saturday, and I knew it had to be serious because the patients don't really call unless it's something serious. So she called me and she says, Dr. Benjamin, um, my back is really, really hurting. Um, I went to see that specialist you told me about, um, that you sent me to, and he told me I had a slipped disc and I needed to lose some weight. She says, and I'm trying, I really am trying, but the ibuprofen is just not strong enough. Can you call me in something stronger? I said, sure, I can call you in something stronger. I could hear the pain in her voice. I said, but today's Saturday, you need to come and see me on Monday or Tuesday. And sure enough, on Tuesday, I walked in the exam room, and there she was leaning over the exam table in so much pain she couldn't sit down. And I said, Miss Smith, did the medicine I called you in, did it help at all? She says, well, Dr. Benjamin, I didn't get it. I said, what do you mean you didn't get it? She says, I couldn't afford it. I said, but you work for the school system. You work in the janitorial department. You have insurance. She says, I know, but I, I don't have the copay. But I get paid on Friday, and I promise you I'll get it. And so I stepped out of the room, and I told her, my nurse, Nell, to go across the street to Jim, our pharmacist, and, and get her medicine. So I went back in the room, and I handed her medicine. I said, Miss Smith, I can see you in a lot of pain. Here's your medicine. I want you to start taking it. And at that moment, her eyes welled up with tears. And she says, oh, Dr. Benjamin, I'm so embarrassed. I didn't want you to have to do that. And at that moment, I realized I had taken her dignity from her. And that, the, that cultural competency has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has to do with allowing people to maintain their dignity. So I had to figure out how to get out of it. So I told her about the fact that you know, we have a small pot of money for our medication fund for times just like this. And so she, I also told her that um, she could pay us back on Friday, but she didn't have to, and she was okay with that. And then as I was leaving the room, she says, oh, by the way, and her, oh, by the way, was, can I get a work excuse? I said, sure, you can get a work excuse. Today's Tuesday, start taking your medicine, you want to go back on Thursday or Friday? She says, oh, no, we have to strip those floors tonight. Here is a woman who cannot sit down because she's in so much pain, but she's willing to strip the wax off the floors so that our children could go to school in a clean environment. And it was for Mrs. Smith and for other Mrs. Smiths like her around the country that I agreed to give up my practice for 23 years to go and help President Obama uh, fight for people just like her. So the Affordable Care Act is not just about building a smarter and sustainable health care system. It's my, about making sure that every American gets the care that they need, when they need it, and a price that they can afford. from ensuring people with pre-existing conditions um, that they can finally get covered, to helping seniors pay less for prescription drugs and guaranteeing that women don't face higher rates just because they're women. We're focused on what really matters most in healthcare, and that's making sure that every American has the security of knowing that their loved ones can always get the care that they need when they need it. We need your help in spreading the word and getting people enrolled in the marketplace, which officially begins in October. If you know people who need insurance, uh, are uninsured, it will be available to them, but they have to sign up. You know, prevention is the foundation of our nation's public health system, and prevention is the foundation of my work as Surgeon General. Health do not, does not occur in the doctor's office and the hospitals only. Health also occurs where we live 
where we learn, where we work, where we play, and where we pray. Health is in everything that we do. I believe that prevention offers the greatest opportunity to improve the health of America's families now and for decades to come. I also believe that prevention is the key to building a stronger and more sustainable health care system. And prevention is not new to the national dialogue. However, in the recent years, it's become more vital and more relevant than ever before. It's become an imperative. And that's largely due to the changing dynamics and the demographics as more American families struggle to deal with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and hypertension and a tragic toll that they take, both personally and financially. Much of the illness and early death related to chronic diseases is caused by just four modifiable health risk behaviors. Lack of physical activity, poor nutrition, tobacco use, and excessive alcohol consumption. Almost 50% of adults have at least one chronic condition. We have to make prevention part of our everyday lives and empower people to make better health choices. So I was pleased that our Obama administration has launched a broad agenda to help Americans get healthy, live longer, stay, wa stay well, and thrive. And as Surgeon General, I have the privilege of chairing the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council that was established by the Affordable Care Act. Our vision is to move our health care system from a focus on sickness and disease to a focus on wellness and prevention. Because if we truly want to reform health care in this country, we need to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. So in addition to the state-of-the-art medicine, we need a new approach to promoting health um, prevention in our communities. Since staying healthy depends on other factors that influence our health, like housing and transportation, education, the availability of affordable food, our workplaces, and our environment. We really want to change the way we think about health in this country. And that's why it's no surprise that I'm so excited about Selman, Spellman's wellness revolution inspiring the entire campus to focus on wellness, to make healthy lifestyles part of the Spelman culture. And this is so important because an alarming number of Spelman students are battling those same chronic illnesses I just mentioned earlier, like hypertension and diabetes, obesity and depression. Spelman's um, re wellness, re oh, that's a tongue tie. <laughs> Spelman's wellness revolution is already changing the health trajectory of its students. And through the students, it's gonna influence the communities that they have and that they will call home. They are gonna be the ones who go back and make that cultural change in the world and change the world. You know, and as you're changing the world, I wanna thank you for your service. It's often said, we make a living by what we get, but we, we make a life by what we give. All of you will become important members of your community. You've been doing service projects and community activities throughout your time here at Spelman. Service is the culture and it's the expectation here. In fact, it was a requirement starting in your first year. And I'd also like to thank the Bonner Scholars for leading the way. You also had product, projects like that you did on your own that were not required like the Sisters Project, the MLK Day of Service, and the Broad Time, Broad Teeny event. That is kind of catchy and cute, but for a great cause. Because of that, you're now prepared to go out and serve your communities, but now you're gonna go out as a Spelman graduate. And that's what leadership is about. I have two favorite styles of leadership. Um, one is the servant leader, which everyone knows about. Um, not you do it because it needs to be done. You see something that needs to be done and you just do it. Not for the glory, not for the fame, just to get it done and make sure it gets happened. You see examples all through the Bible. You're going to see examples here with my fellow honorary degree recipients. But the best example is really you and what you've been doing since you've been here and what you're going to do in, in the future and service. The other style I call 
leadership from behind. And I know the students already know about this style of leadership because they've been doing it. But leadership from behind is when you rise to a level of success that you don't forget to reach back and pull others up with you. That's a good leader. But a great leader doesn't stop there. A great leader will push you out in front of them and make you become a better leader than they were. Yeah. And they'll also do like the young people say, you'll, they'll let you know they've got your back. That if you start to stumble or think you're gonna stumble or think you're gonna fall, those great leaders are back there to keep you from doing that. They're gonna have your back. And that's what the faculty and, and Spelman will be for you for years to come. If you ever need them 20 years from now, 50 years from now, they'll be here and they'll have your back for you. That's great leadership. You know, people look up to you and they're gonna look up to you. They look up to you now. If you're getting a degree from Spelman, you are um, leaders to them and you inspire them. When I was um, in practice in Alabama, we had this program called AHEC, where we took young girls to college campuses and, and they would see things and, and try to get them interested in, in college, and they're young girls, um, 12, 10, 12 years old. And one of our programs, there was this young girl who went to this really beautiful ca campus, and she made the comment, it's so beautiful. The buildings are so beautiful. And she was in awe. She said, they're so beautiful. When I grow up, do you think they'll let me clean? Didn't want to have her think that cleaning is bad because it's, it's not. But we wanted to instill in her that she could go to school, get her degree, and come back, open a company, and clean every building in the entire state if she'd like. It's little girls like her that's looking at you today. They're looking at you to see that they can be just like you. You never know who's watching you. You know, when I was, um, would get my name in the paper, for example, I would get a, a picture in the paper as a magazine or something, and then the, the reporters would call, and they want a, a, a quote or something. And I'm seeing patients, so I would say, I, you know, I don't have time. I've got to be bothered. I've got to see patients until one day I got an envelope in the mail. It was a manila envelope with, filled with letters from a second grade class. And they said, I saw your picture in the paper and I wanna be a doctor just like you. You never know who's watching you. And every time you get your picture in the paper or an award, it's not about you alone. It's about those who are looking at you. And along those lines, I just want to make a little bit of a commercial and say, we need to encourage more minorities to enter health careers. <laughs> Spelman's been doing a, a great job at this, but we also need everybody in this room just to encourage a young kid who may even think of it. Today, while there's 30% of the po nation's population is minority, less than 6% of, of the physicians are minority. The numbers are just as low for dentists and pharmacists and other nurses and other professions. That percentage is the same percentage as during the inflection report of 1912. We need to encourage kids to go into science and, and technology and education and math and medicine. <laughs> And as America's doctor, I just want to tell you why you're changing the world, that you need to take care of yourselves, that you need to um, exercise, eat well, maintain those friendships, keep those social connections together. You know, when I was on a plane coming here yesterday, the flight attendant said, put your own face mask on before attempting to help others. 
you need to take care of yourselves first. And, you know, I'm looking forward to joining that sisterhood of Spelman it's so famous for in a few minutes. But I want to end and conclude with a poem. And it's a poem which was one of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays' favorite poem. And it's, in, it's by an unknown author, but it's entitled God Minute. And it goes like this. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, yet eternity is in it. I know you will take your God minute and go out and change the world. Thank you, and congratulations, class of 2013. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.